Hey everybody, BTO Pro here, back with another installment of How Hacks the Web Works. So today uh, we're going to look at a bit of our internal critique process um, that we go through kind of on a regular basis um, and how that translates into increased code quality, um, but that we can actually leverage our own tooling to not need to relearn each other's mental models. So what do I mean? Well, so as we've been, if you've been following along, we work in a mono repo. We call that LRN Web Components because it's where all of our assets uh, are built. And all of us contribute to one block in here. Now, Nikki is infamous for working on some really, really complicated elements and boiling them down um, to very little. So one she's been working on a lot recently is called Editable Table. Um, so it's a table editor as web component. And so let's look at what that is. Now, again, I haven't worked on this at all. It does say I pushed a uh, commit, but it's literally just like a version. I, I don't know anything about the structure of Nikki's element. Uh, and that's kind of part of the point here. So I've got this clone locally. I did yarn install, so I already have that here. I know that because of our mono repo, I can go to slash or CD elements slash editable table. And I'm going to be in the right place. I know that in here I can run yarn start and that I will get an identical editing and working experience um, to what I know I have been doing. So this is going to load up. Sometimes it's a more complex element. You have to hit refresh once it's, it starts. Um, and so, and by complex element, I mean there's a lot of classes involved in this. Um, so see there's editable table. Nikki's done a great job of having additional forms of demonstrating this. Um, and you can see this is really well documented as far as like, here's all the CSS variables you could use, properties. She does a fantastic job of documenting um, these elements in a way that's usable by other developers. So now I've got this running. This is in a, a watch directory. So now I'm going to open another window here. Um, and it's just so that I can find the right file to open. Now, all of our repos or you know elements here are going to have a src slash whatever and in the whatever is the stuff that's being monitored so this is the editable table element now again just from a process and workflow standpoint i know that there's going to be things imported at the top here's how that documentation showed up on that other page um, so that's why you have all those css variables this is why you have the multiple demos and what the labels are so this is uh, a convention that isn't like a standard is just the way that uh, Polymer's uh, command line interface allows you to generate that little site. So this is something a Polymer serve uh, generates, not Polymer element, the like thing that you use in the browser. This is command line tooling to help do this stuff. So you can see that we've got editable table extends uh, Polymer element and she's leveraging behaviors. Now Nikki loves applying mix-ins to things um, to mix functionality in. And I'm not uh, not knocking it at all. It does make things a little abstract. Um, so it's kind of, it can become confusing as to where stuff comes from. An example of this, because I have looked at this for a little bit, is Iron Ajax. So you can see there's Iron Ajax and that's pulled in, but I believe if I look in the behavior that it also dynamically pulls in Iron Ajax. Um, so immediately, here's a here's a little goofy thing. Um, so it's pulling an Iron Ajax in that behavior via dynamic import, and it's referencing it here. Now, just because of the way that this stuff works, that's not going to cause a problem. Um, these are required to, for the dependency tree, though, versus a dynamic import is not going to block the dependency tree. So um, another... Another thing that's nice, uh, just in having an IDE, right, that color codes things, you can see after next render is in here, but it's never actually implemented. So then I can just safely delete this. So that frees up a dependency that's no longer in the render tree, or blocking the render tree, I should say. So that's useful. Um, now, as far as abstraction and the behaviors portion, right, I could choose to lazy load this Iron Ajax via here, I, I personally, I like it being in here. So I'm going to actually go into the behavior in this case. I'm going to get rid of that Iron Ajax. Um, I don't know that she had it there with any intention. Oh, and I only say that because if I look at and search for Iron Ajax um, across the editable table elements, 
It only shows up once. <laughs> so it shows up an editable table display. Now that does have display behaviors mixed into it. Um, but I think it's a little confusing as to why that dependency isn't referenced. I've also noticed uh, data binding issues at times when dynamically importing things like uh, DOM repeats, DOM ifs, and Iron Ajax uh, specifically. So I'm gonna go snag that import reference for Iron Ajax. Um, you can see it does show up in our SRC directory, but also in the lib directory. So lib is where we add in other things that are um, dependent upon the main element, basically. Um, we have added stuff there that isn't used or is used elsewhere. Um, but generally, we try to keep things grouped together uh, so that when you're working on the primary element that you're doing your watch directory on, it's the SRC folder. And that these other elements are kind of, you're not leveraging the tooling in the same way. Um, so you don't get the same abstraction. Notice some of our other repos, you've seen this .js split out into a .css and .html and those things. You don't get that added efficiency or, well, workflow interest uh, with the lib directory. But, so a minor thing, right? Um, just making sure that that's in place. I can go and search for display behaviors and see that display behaviors is mixed in there and it's also mixed in, well, it's defined in there, but it's using the SRC directory, I know that. Uh, so now I've got that dependency resolved, right? It doesn't need to dynamically import Iron Ajax um, because it's not pulling in a template. So that doesn't really make sense to abstract. Now, another thing, and I noticed this just from the, and this is kind of a preference thing, but I've noticed Nikki does do this a lot, um, is this is the correct way to define, right? So there's editable table display. If you imagine that tags in the interface, and then it has an attribute called column header. So this is making sure that this has that selector. However, with something like column, you're not forced to put host there. I don't know that it really hurts anything, but it's just not needed. Um, now, if you are defining, right, in this case, there's a responsive breakpoint, then yeah, you absolutely do need that selector to hit column correctly. So I don't have a ton of feedback for this element because that's not the part I'm looking for. The thing I'm looking for and what I really want to show is taking something uh, workflow wise that's done, been done in Polymer Element, which historically we've used all over the place and doing some form of audit to say, do we need to do it this way anymore? So if I look through and, and what my eyes for assessment, do we need to do it this way? Um, is usually, is it doing anything that's so specific to Polymer Element um, that we can't really change. Now, there are ways to do two-way data binding without Polymer Element, but Polymer Element makes it so easy to do that right now we just haven't moved off of it. So I don't see any two-way data binding. You would recognize two-way data binding like this. Um, so we don't have any of that, so that's good. The other thing I would look for is under properties, um, default things other than default values and reflection. So uh, Polymer lets you do uh, observers and computeds, those are not concepts in the um, in in um, lit element, what I want to start converting things to. You can do these things other ways. It's just mostly like how difficult is this going to be, you know, how much testing you're going to have to do to un unwield this. So um, you can see bubbles canceled. It is composed. Cool. Uh, so I don't really see anything. Oh, the other big one is if you see at apply. So if you don't have an at apply in your CSS, you're probably safe as well. Okay, so I'm not seeing anything that really would prevent this from being a lit element. So let's look at what that transformation uh, would be. So instead of polymer element, I'm gonna use lit element. Now I know the class location for lit element. And so I'll just paste this in here for shortcut purposes. But we're gonna pull in from lit element slash lit element .js lit element, HTML, and CSS. Now we need all of these helpers, um, but because that used to be HTML, now I can ax it. And so now instead of Polymer element, I do lit element. Um, and then you get into some convention differences. So CSS is handled differently in lit element. 
and it looks more like this. And I have this just pasted in as an example because that way I don't goof up the syntax in trying to write it. So you can see that we define our styles separately. So in Polymer, they were all lumped together in one template, but in Lit Element, you can do them separately. Now, you could, I believe, just do this and return the CSS output of that. I, I've seen advantages to doing it as an array in case you had multiple chunks of it, so I'm just gonna leave it that way. You see this is within an array here. So now, I'm gonna take these styles, and I don't bring in the style tag, I just bring in the CSS itself. So now I can dump the CSS in there. I could, you know, additionally go through and do this, get rid of iron eye, you know, these selectors um, as far as specificity. And I don't believe they'll have any negative repercussion here because um, they should be the same level. And with Shadow Dom, it's not a huge deal. Now, it, there could be some influence here, so we'll see in a second. <laughs> Um, the next thing I have to do, once I've fixed the CSS and migrated it to styles here, is uh, the render function. So the render function changes, and it's very minor. It's just this. So render function instead of that static get template. And then I'm going to have to clean up the way that we do this data binding. Um, so the way that we do data binding in lit element, uh, if you have a click event or any event, instead of an on hyphen, which was the polymer convention, you do an at symbol. And then instead of this nonsensical um, data binding, <laughs> to be perfectly honest, that is polymer where you do these braces, uh, you use template literal syntax. And template literal syntax looks like that. You do a dollar sign and then an open bracket and then this dot, whatever. So now I can just start copying this around, all right, filtered, where else do we have one dot, one dot for text, dot text, and for column index, okay, do we have any other double, no, we don't have any additional data binding via the double brackets, cool, so now I've got my click handler moved over, let's make sure there's no events I'm not being able to see, doesn't look like it. Awesome. Uh, that's going to be not filtered like that. Another thing is that um, Polymer used this, this little dollar sign equals. That was for an attribute bind. In lit element, it's like that. Use a dot hidden in this case. And that'll ensure that the attribute is correctly binded, uh, in this case, from a property. So that should largely be it. Um, Oh yeah, default values. Okay, so this is another big piece. So um, there's no default value definition in the properties at this level. What you do instead is in the constructor you define these. So I don't have a constructor right here, so I can do a constructor, super. And then I just have to do this value setting by hand. So. Some of this um, is moving you closer to quote unquote the platform um, in that like this is the jo the pure JavaScript way you should have been doing this. But Polymer was giving us some training wheels to be able to not have to f uh, fight through and write a bunch of code over and over again. So filtered and then we see that there's text and text is going to have a default value of nothing. So you set your defaults in the constructor after super. Um, and then the other one that's changed but is still here is, um, this is reflect. So you can still make these properties be reflected. It's not reflect to attribute as a verbose, it's just the word reflect. Um, so that now I believe will be everything that we had to do to convert it from polymer element to lit element. And let's see if we have any issues. So refresh, hit demo. And what button was I working on? It was the editable table filter. Okay. So the easiest way to tell if this is causing any issues at first is we just pull up console, make sure we refresh. There's nothing obvious. That's fine. Um, and then there's the filter. 
So the filter tag in here, sorting and filtering. Let's see if that's the tag in question. Editable table, there's a field group there. And in that field group, there's this editable table editor toggle, but I'm looking for a filter. Editable table filter, there we go. So easy way to tell if this is, you know, the will it blend test. You open up and expand this element. If it has a shadow root, the definition came through correctly. It's registering as a lit element, congratulations. Now it doesn't mean that everything just magically works there. Um, but it does mean that the vast majority of it is going to work. Um, so that's nice. Got these filters on here. Stuff things put in table. This is a really awesome tag, by the way. If you haven't, if you haven't used it yet, and then I can turn off edit mode, and I've just got her awesome. To, oh, I turned off edit mode on this one up here. My bad. Um, so you know I can modify this filter in real time, kind of a thing. So that's pretty awesome. Um, it appears to have worked. I have the editable table filter. Yep, that filter button is working. You can filter based on what that is in context, filter by vertical. And so all the events are still happening. Everything's flowing through and working. And let's just do a quick inspect. I did click a bunch of things. I'm not seeing any console errors, so that's awesome. Okay, so some additional things you can do now in here is, um, is get back to that render tree connotation. So paper button has a click handler. And so generally when there's like events, um, event binding, I like to have that actually be part of the process of this setting up. However, I can take the iron icons and the paper tooltip and those could be um, done in a non-blocking way. Now, editable table filter though, and this is where this can also get um, not tricky, but just like something to consider is, so let's search for where editable table filter is used. So editable table filter is leveraged in editable table display. And so we've got editable table, see there's sort, and filter is going to be the same way, I bet. It's going to be inside of a DOM if statement. And there it is. So that means it's contextually loaded, right? It's, it may or may not be there. Another cool thing about quote unquote use the platform, right? I'm doing data binding via Polymer <laughs> to send it down into a lit element. That lit element then invokes other Polymer elements, right? So we're progressively moving between um, these micro frameworks. The two are completely compatible with one another uh, just as a result of both being built on web components. And I can swap them out at will because they're going to, as long as I get my element correct and the data binding of my element, the other element is going to be in charge of handling data its way. So this is contextually loaded. I probably can then take, not styles, but filter and sort, or sorry, conditionally loaded, I should say. Um, because it's conditionally loaded, I can take filter and sort and we can move those into a different lifecycle hook. So I won't do it on, I could do it on connected. And at times that's what we've done with this after next render. Um, I'm actually not entirely sold on if that's required, if that's like doing much performance wise, but because we don't have a constructor here, we'll do super. And then we're gonna actually pull these in on the fly. And so how that changes things is that whenever the page is booting up and it gets told to load editable table display, right? Imagine there's all these spiders going off in the in, in URL requests and it has to spider and parse all of these before JS, JS modules, which these are deployed as JavaScript modules, will actually finish and then execute. So if you can do things like this with what's a dynamic, a dynamic import. The dynamic import doesn't register as blocking the render tree. It doesn't have to be spidered prior to rendering and assembling. So all the dependencies downstream of this, while important and tied to these, won't block the overall execution of the page setting itself up. 
So now that I moved those over to dynamic rendering, you don't notice any difference, right? I'm not getting any type of a console error. And if I do a network request and we don't do XHR, let's do JS files and to further um, make sure this makes sense. Let's just do the demo. So this is the demo um, for Nikki's demo loading. You can see everything shows up right around uh, there, right around simple picker option being loaded. So and you can actually see there, right? And then stuff loads after the fact. And there's this little cascade jump here. See it in the waterfall? That is the jump over to all of this dynamically imported stuff happening. And so if we don't do the dynamic import, if we had these at the top of the document, they're going to block and you're going to have to have 167 requests to get all the way there. But because I don't dynamically import those, I can make sure that the page is going to start to render at this option. And then the rest of this stuff is going to pick up and load. So you get kind of this little fractally lazy load effect as a result. So that's all I wanted to show today as far as this. We do this type of work very uh, common in, in LRN web components and just all the things hacks related. And so because we have that unified tooling, I can dig in, make these changes um, without really having an issue. I can have the same process and testing that I would normally. And then I can say improved performance of editable table. Right, and there's been you know some minor tweaks editable table basically, but it's gonna it is ultimately gonna improve performance and push us a little bit closer to using lit element and the platform uh, more natively as a result. So if you're interested in getting involved with anything any of the properties we're working on, we have over 300 web components that are out there. Um, you can go to github.com slash elmsalens slash LRN web components, uh, clone the repo and start picking through the many, many elements that are there. Um, and because of this mono repo, we'll all be able to stay on the same page and publish versions out to NPM in a consistent manner. Thanks for watching. Mm -hmm.